I'm a consultant physician, and you can see I'm a gastroenterologist as well. And you thought, well, might think, well, what's a gastroenterologist doing talking about chronic fatigue? Well, does anyone remember Cookfield Hospital? Anyone been to Cookfield Hospital? One or two people. I was appointed to Cookfield Hospital in 1984 as the only full-time physician. And um, so my days were spent doing hearts, chests, diabetes, and gastroenterology. I'm a primarily a gastroenterologist. But my first weekend in Sussex, I was asked to see a patient at home and by our, our village GP. I'll call him David. Um, David was a male of 47 years. He was a headmaster, so a very responsible job. But he had an eight month history of really extreme fatigue, such that he was unable to work. Talking to him, he fulfilled the clinical criteria for a diagnosis of chronic fatigue. But when I examined him, there was absolutely nothing to find. But all we could offer in those days was graduated exercise, and that's what I advised him. And um, over the following four years, he made a complete recovery from his illness. He's still alive, 30 years later, still lives in our village, and he actually was awarded the OBE in the Millennium Honours for his services to education. This patient was one that really fired my imagination about what chronic fatigue might be. There's a story told of two medical students, <clears throat> and they were London medical students, so they're walking down the road behind a man who was limping rather badly. And one medical student said to his colleague, I think that chap's got a, 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 a osteoarthritis of his hip. And the other says, oh, don't be stupid. He's just got a sprained ankle. And they kept on arguing about it. In the end, they plucked up courage to go up to this man and say, excuse me, sir, we're, we're medical students from St. Bart's Hospital, and um, we're just debating as to why you're limping so much. So my friend here thinks that you've got a sprained ankle. I think you've got osteoarthritis of your hip. And the chap looked at them and said, well, you, you thought I had a sprained ankle, and you were wrong. Your friend thought you had a, I had an osteoarthritis of the hip, and he was wrong. I thought I had wind, and I was wrong. <laughs> My reason for that is there's a lot of fall storms that I've experienced in 30 years of looking after chronic fatigue patients. And I think I've probably seen about 1,100 patients with chronic fatigue over those 30 years. But a lot of fall storms. What are, the, what are those fall storms? Back in the early 80s, Professor Mowbray at St Mary's Hospital produced um, a paper suggesting that almost 100% of patients with chronic fatigue had VP1 antigen in their blood. Over the following few years, that we had to admit that he was wrong, and we now no longer do the VP1 antigen. Then, in the late 80s, uh, a group from Southampton said, oh, it's all due to low intra intracellular magnesium. And uh, we started measuring red cell magnesium on patients, and if they were low, giving them intramuscular magnesium. That's no longer done. They've, that's never been re reproduced, that was researched by other centres other than Southampton. Ephemol marine. Maybe a place for evening primrose oil. This has got fish oils as well in it. But there was a study done by the Glasgow group um, in the late 80s, which suggested that it was valuable for patients with chronic fatigue. The problem is, it was a double-blind study, and it's about the only double-blind study that's ever been done. Um, half received ephemeral marine, the other half received liquid paraffin. Now, I think that the, the, there was a great difference between the two groups, mainly because some of the patients on liquid paraffin having to take 18 capsules of it a day were a bit poorly as a result <laughs> rather than the benefit from the ephemeral marine. <coughs> Gulf War Syndrome. Um, in the 
um, early 90s, um, people came, began to draw a lot of parallels between chronic fatigue and the Gulf War Syndrome. And there was a vogue for giving <coughs> Gulf War Syndrome veterans large doses of broad-spectrum antibiotics. And that was used for patients with chronic fatigue without really any great success. Put down the lightning process. I've said a full storm. It's not really a full storm um, because it is still available now. And if you were here, I think it was six years ago. Um, is that right, Colin? Six years ago? Yeah. 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 And we had a very heated argument about the value of the lightning process. As a result of that, um, Colin arranged an audit of people who belonged to the Sussex ME Society and whether they had been exposed to the process. And I think it was 65 who had, and 80% of those found it of benefit. So it's something I still mention to patients. A few years ago, you may remember all this, the stuff about a murine retrovirus, XMRV, and again, a, a, a laboratory in the States showed that this was something that really could distinguish patients who had chronic fatigue from other conditions. Unfortunately, it was a laboratory contaminant, and that paper has had to be withdrawn. <coughs> I had a, probably two or three years ago, I had a a number of patients coming to me and saying, could they have Valgan cyclovir? Why is that? And somebody got on, um, on the internet. But when you went to look at the papers, the original papers, this Val Valgan cyclovir was being used for treating cytomegalous virus infections in patients who had AIDS. And a few of these patients who had fatigue, their fatigue got better. And somehow it got into the, uh, onto the internet suggesting that this might be a treatment for chronic fatigue, but I think there's no evidence for that. A few other conditions that we're always aware of when we're seeing patients with chronic fatigue, sleep apnea. Um, patients who, whose sleep is interrupted a lot at night, and so they have daytime somnolence. And uh, that's not really what chronic fatigue is. It's not really daytime sleepiness. It is a true fatigue. But we're always aware of that, and I referred a few of my patients to my respiratory co colleagues for an investigation of that. Ellis Danlos. Uh, when I went to um, medical school, there was just one sort of Ellis Danlos. There's now at least five types, and uh, Ellis Danlos type 3 um, does have some autonomic disturbance. Um, which can sometimes present with similar symptoms to chronic fatigue. And more recently, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POTS. And um, that again, some people have said, I think, that as many as a third of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome who are diagnosed in that way may actually have POTS. And I know that Gabriel may be mentioning a little bit of that in passing. So I've told you where we've come in the last 30 years, and it seems to have been leading up a lot of back alleys. And um, I'm just going to ask, say that really today we want to look at some of these new developments and encourage what can, encouragements can we expect from research um, that's coming up and being done. It's very encouraging seeing how much research is being done at the moment into chronic fatigue. And... Um, we have two very distinguished speakers today who are contributing to that. And uh, we also have Sonia and Mary Jane, who are um, CEOs of the Action for ME and for the Association for Young People with ME. And they will tell us more about the research that is being done. <coughs> 